Chapter Three of All the Brothers Were Valiant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Roger Moline. All the Brothers Were Valiant by Ben Ames Williams. Chapter Three. The brothers of the House of Shore had been, on the whole, slow to take to themselves wives. Matt had never married, nor Noah, nor Mark. John had a wife for the weeks he was at home before his last cruise, but he did not take her with him on that voyage, and there was no John Shore to carry on the name. John Shore's widow was called Rachel. She had been Rachel Holt, and her sister's name was Priscilla. Rachel was one of those women who suggest slumbering fires. She was slow of speech and quiet and calm. But John Shore and Mark had both loved her, and when she married John, Mark laughed a hard and reckless laugh that made the woman afraid. John and Mark never spoke, one to another, after that marriage. Rachel's sister, Priscilla, was a gay and careless child. She was six years younger than Joel, and she had acquired in babyhood the habit of thinking Joel the most wonderful created thing. Their yards adjoined, and she was the baby of her family, and he of his. Thus the big boy and the little girl had always been comrades and allies against the world. Before Joel first went to sea, as ship's boy, the two had decided they would some day be married. Joel went to supper that night at Priscilla's home. He was alone in his own house, and Mrs. Holt was a person with a mother's heart. Rachel lived at home. She gave Joel quiet welcome at the door, before Priscilla in the kitchen heard his voice and came flying to overwhelm him. She had been making popovers, and there was flour on her fingers, and on Joel's best black coat when she was done with him. Rachel brushed it off when Pris had run back to her oven. They sat down at table. Mrs. Holt at one end, her husband, he was a big man, an old sea captain, and full of yarns as a knitting bag, at the other, and Rachel at one side, facing Pris and Joel. Joel's ship had come in only that day. The Nathan Ross had been in port for weeks, so the whole town knew Mark Shore's story. They spoke of it now, and Joel told them what he knew. Rachel wondered if there was any chance that Mark might still be alive. Her father broke in with a story of Mark's first cruise, when the boy had saved a man's life by his quickness with the hatchet on the racing line. The town was full of such stories, for Mark was one of those men about whom legends arise. And now he was gone. Priscilla listened to the talk with the wide eyes of youth, awed by the mystery and majesty of tragic things. She remembered Mark as a huge man, like a pagan god, in whose eyes she had been only a thin-legged little girl who made faces through the fence. After supper, when the others had left them in the parlor together, she said to Joel, "'Do you think he's dead?' Her voice was a whisper. "'I aim to know,' said Joel. Rachel looked in at the door. "'You needn't bother with the dishes, Pris,' she said. "'I'll do them.' Priscilla had forgotten all about that task. She ran contritely toward her sister. "'Oh, I'm sorry, Rachel. I will. I will do them. Joel and I—' Rachel laughed softly. "'I don't mind them. You two stay here.' Priscilla accepted the offer in the end, but she had no notion of staying in the tight-windowed parlor, with its harsh carpet on the floor and its samplers on the walls. She was of the new generation— the generation which discovered that the night is beautiful and not unhealthy. "'Let's go outside,' 
she said to Joel. There's a moon. We can sit on the bench under the apple tree. They went out, side by side. Joel was not a tall man, but he was inches taller than Priscilla. She was tiny, a dainty, sweetly proportioned creature, built on fine lines that were strangely out of keeping with the stalwart stock from which she sprung. Her hair was darker than Joel's. It was a brown so dark that it was almost black. But her eyes were vividly blue, and her lips were vividly red, and her cheeks were bright. She slipped her hand through Joel's big arm as they crossed the yard, and when they had found the seat, she drew his arm frankly about her shoulders. "'I'm cold,' she said, laughing up at him. "'You must keep me warm.' The moon flecked down through the leaves upon her face. There was moonlight on her cheek and on her mouth, but her thick hair and her eyes were shadowed and mysterious. Joel saw that her lips were smiling. She drew his head down toward hers. Joel was flesh and blood, and she panted and gasped and pushed him away and smoothed her hair and laughed at him. "'I love you to be so strong,' she whispered happily. He had not told them at supper of his promotion. He told Priscilla now, and the girl could not sit still beside him. She danced in the path before the seat. She perched on his knee and caught his big shoulders in her tiny hands and tried to shake him back and forth in her delight. "'You don't act a bit excited,' she scolded. "'You don't act as though you were glad a bit.' "'Aren't you glad, Joe? Aren't you just so proud?' "'Yes,' he told her. "'Of course. Yes. Yes, I am glad, and I am proud.' "'Oh!' she cried. "'I could—I could just hug you in two. She tried it, tightening her arms about his big neck, clinging to him. He sat stiff and awkward under her caresses, thrilling with a happiness that he did not know how to express. He felt uneasy, half embarrassed. Her ecstasy continued. Then, abruptly, it passed. She became practical. Still upon his knee, she began to ask questions. When would he sail away? She had heard that Nathan Ross was almost ready. When would he come back? When would he be rich so that they might be married? Would it be long? Joel found tongue. We will be married Monday, he said slowly. We will go away on the Nathan Ross together. I do not want to go alone. She slipped from his knee, stood before him. Why, Joel, you're... You're just crazy to think of it. He shook his head. No, he said. No, I have thought all about it. It is the best thing to do. We will be married Monday, and we will make a bigger cabin on the Nathan Ross. His voice always slowed a little as he spoke the name of his first ship. You will be happy on her, he said. You will like it all. The sea? She returned to his knee, tumbling his hair. You silly! Men don't understand. Why, I couldn't be ready for ever so long. And I wouldn't dare go away with you for so awfully long. I just couldn't. Her eyes misted with thought, and she said quite seriously, Why, Joel, we might find we didn't like each other at all. But we'd be on the ship with no way to get away from it for three years. Don't you see? Joel said calmly, That is not so, because we know about liking each other already. I know how it is with you. It is clothes that you are thinking about. Well, you can get them in the stores. And you have many already. 
You have new dresses whenever I see you. She laughed gaily. But, Joel, you only see me once in three years. Of course I have new dresses then. But I just couldn't. She laughed again, a faint uneasiness in her laughter. She left his knee and sat down soberly beside him. She was feeling a little crushed, smothered, as though she were being pushed back against a wall. Joel said steadily, "'Mr. Worthen will be glad to know you go with me, and everyone will be glad for you.' She burst abruptly into tears. She was miserable, she told him. He was making her miserable. She hated to be bullied, and he was trying to bully her. She hated him. She wouldn't marry him. Never. He could go off on his old ship and never come back. That was all. She would not go, and he ought not to ask her to anyway. To prove how much she hated him, she nestled against his side and his arm enfolded her. Joel had not the outward seeming of a wise man. Nevertheless, he now said, the other girls will all be envying you to be married so quickly and carried away the very next day. Her sobs miraculously ceased, and he smiled quietly down upon her dark head against his breast. Everyone will do things for you, the whole town. They will come down to see us sail away. He fell silent, leaving his words for her consideration. She remained very quiet against his side for a long time, breathing very softly. He thought he could almost read her thoughts. "'It will be,' he said, "'like a story, like a romance.' And the words sounded strangely on his sober lips. But at the word the girl sat up quickly, both hands gripping his arm. He could see her eyes dancing in the moonlight. "'Oh, Joe!' she cried. "'It would really be just loads of fun, and terribly romantic. Wonderful!' She pressed a hand to her cheek, thinking, "'And if I could—' "'She could,' she said, "'do thus and so.' Joel listened, and he smiled for he knew that his bride would sail away with him. End of chapter 3 Recording by Roger Moline